Hey everyone, welcome back to the Universe. Glad to join us today. Today I'm joined by Dr. Paul Barker, also the Reverend Paul Barker. He's a bishop in down in Melbourne in Australia. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Uh, good to see you. Thanks, Zach. I'm I'm going well. Yeah, I'm super excited for this conversation um, and talking about the book of Deuteronomy and big questions going on and really just kind of like looking at everything going along with this book. Um, so to start off, Paul, do you want to just talk a little bit about like who you are, what you do, what got, inter- you got, what got you interested in things such as this? Sure, sure. Well, uh, currently I'm uh, an Anglican bishop in uh, the Diocese of Melbourne in Australia. Melbourne's a city of about five million. And I've been doing that uh, for about four and a half years. Melbourne's where I come from and um, lived most of my life. Um, I was uh, in in pastoral ministry in Melbourne um, for a long time in one church for about 14 years. And uh, but as well as that teaching in our Bible college, Ridley College, uh, teaching Old Testament as a visiting lecturer for about 20 years. And then I had seven years overseas living in Malaysia. and traveling before I lived at, lived there to teach in seminaries in Asia and train preachers. So I was teaching in a seminary in Malaysia for half a year each year and then traveling to teach intensive courses in Myanmar, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, uh, in different uh, Bible colleges, also in China for a while, and also training preachers through mainly through Langham Partnership, which I know operates in the USA as well. So uh, a, a bit of a mix of things overseas and uh, still keep up quite an interest in uh, teaching overseas when I can. And um, uh, though COVID has stopped all that for the last uh, 18 months. Mm. So that, that's a little bit about me. Mm. That's super exciting. So what got you interested um, in things such as like the book of Deuteronomy? Well, I was on a train trip when I was about 18 and um I, I did my university degree in Sydney, which is about a thousand kilometers from Melbourne. And each uh, term break, I would get the train uh, to and from for 12 hours. And, uh, and I realized when I was 18 that I hadn't ever read the Bible through from start to finish. I'd read lots of it here and there, but uh, I decided I'd read it through from the start. But of course, like most people, you get halfway through Exodus and then you slow down because it gets more tedious with all the different laws and the details of the tabernacle and then the sacrifices. So I decided I'd use this train trip to finish reading the Pentateuch, so the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then I knew Joshua onwards was more interesting. But um, as I read Deuteronomy in that train trip, and I must have read Leviticus and Numbers already uh, that day, I suppose, uh, I just found it um, uh, was breathtakingly alive and relevant and exciting. And I wrote notes on things which I kept actually, I lost them in in some damage to property, but um, uh, only a few years ago. And um, and so thereafter, Deuteronomy was really my favorite book. And uh, I love the speaking to the heart that you find in Deuteronomy. And, um, and so when I went to then study theology, which I started doing when I was 20, um, Old Testament was my favorite uh, sub, you know, area really. And I, right from the start, I wanted to major in Old Testament, which I did and did uh, my major paper on Deuteronomy and, um, and preached it uh, in different places uh, as well. And then uh, after a couple of years in pastoral ministry, I was being urged by several people to do more study. And um, so I thought, well, if this is of God, the doors will open. And they opened immediately, really, the first mm-hmm letter I wrote. I was offered a scholarship with the professor that I wanted to be my supervisor in the UK. And so I wrote my PhD on Deuteronomy. And um, hmm. and I've taught it in some way or preached it in some way every year. Um, and I thought it would be until this year because COVID has stopped a lot of things happening that I'm normally involved with. But I guess this, uh, this podcast is my sort of Deuteronomy uh, splurge for the year now. <laughs> well, I'm glad I can fulfill that splurge for you, I guess, Paul. Um, so what got you, I'm just curious, like, what got you interested in De- Deuteronomy? Why did it stick out to you um, and why you eventually wrote your dissertation on to, in it? Uh, there are a number of things. I think I think the initial thing was was how, because it's a sermon and um, it, it, it sort of, it speaks into the heart more obviously than, say, Leviticus and Numbers which I've also now preached and taught and uh, and so on as well. But uh, Deuteronomy, I think, um, 
does that more explicitly. And I think uh, one of the areas I've sort of done a little bit of work on and a couple of my students who are supervised have worked on more than I have is in the rhetoric of the book of Deuteronomy. So I think I think the rhetoric uh, engages us. I mean, it's not quite mm. the sort of high rhetoric of you know, Martin Luther King or um, or whatever, but um, but it's still more captivating language. But then I think um, I think in the end, uh, the, the, what what's kept me going with the Book of Deuteronomy? It, well, firstly, it's diversity. There's laws and narrative, a great mix of things, all embedded as a sermon. But it's also, I think, one of the the linchpin passages for connecting Old and New Testaments together. And uh, I think too many Christians have a view that the Old Testament is sort of legalistic and the New Testament's about faith and grace, but um, which I think is a, a fundamentally wrong view. Mm. But, um, but Deuteronomy, I think, puts that together in a, in a compelling way um, as it looks forward to the New Testament, to an ultimate work of grace. And um, so my PhD thesis was on well, it's published as the as the triumph of grace in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. I mean, and um, but it's it's really an an investigation into the nature of sin and grace uh, in Deuteronomy. And what I think we find is uh, so consistent into the New Testament as well. So uh, Israel has failed in the past. Two times in particular are recounted in Deuteronomy. So in chapters one to three, it's the spies incident from Numbers 13 and 14. When Israel sends spies into the land, they come back and report the enemy are great and fortified. We don't think we should go here. We're scared. Let's you know avoid the land. And the people chicken out, basically. And they're, they're, they're condemned then, really, to a generation in the wilderness for the children to inherit the land. Hmm. And uh, But what the, the nature there of their sin, but the grace that keeps going, because God could have just abandoned them and started again with another group of people. But he didn't. And then in chapter 9, uh, Deuteronomy recounts the golden calf incident from Exodus 32 to 34, abbreviated form, but the same thing, a sin that is fundamentally significant and yet an act of grace to keep going. It's in response to Moses' prayer of intercession at the end of Deuteronomy 9. But um, why does God show such grace? And then the third time in Deuteronomy is, is a forward-looking so Moses in Deuteronomy 29 looks forward or anticipates the failure of Israel to come in the land in the future, but an ultimate work of grace that will restore the people to the land from exile and change their hearts in Deuteronomy 30. The two chapters go together. And so twice in the past, once looking into the future, but the same premise, that is God's anger, wrath, motivated by deep sin, really, uh, in each case, but then an act of grace, an act of grace that's founded, I think, on the Abrahamic promises. So God's faithfulness mm. to them is critical in understanding grace in the Old Testament, but a grace in uh, ultimately that will change the hearts. And that I think um, uh, that that's one of my favourite passages. I think in Scripture is this uh, chapter thirty of Deuteronomy, and. Um, and, and at the center point of it is that uh, I will I will circumcise your hearts and you will love God and obey God. And that, I think, is what the Old Testament looks forward to uh, all the way into the New Testament. It uses different language at times to look forward. So Jeremiah 31, the New Covenant passage, writing the law on the heart, is the same idea, slightly different language. Ezekiel 36 speaks of the heart of stone becoming a heart of flesh. Same idea again, but slightly different language. Um, uh, looking forward to something internal happening. And that's what, what the cross does. So the cross doesn't mm -hmm. merely forgive, uh, but provides the circumcision of the heart. The language is used in Romans 2 and Colossians 2 as well. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. So um, the first thing we're going to do is kind of lay the context. Um, so I'm curious to start off. Um, we have this book of Deuteronomy that's in our Bibles. Um, where does this book come from? Yes, well, there are lots of views about this, and uh, for those who've studied Old Testament, they will know that there are a, a whole a spectrum of views about the origins of Old Testament documents, and indeed uh, reconstructions to varying degrees or other of Old Testament history. Uh, I'm conservative on this matter, so fundamentally Deuteronomy derives from Moses, 
who preached the book, uh, we're told that in, in, well, at the beginning, it's emphasized in the opening paragraph of Deuteronomy. And uh, it's also clear in Deuteronomy 31, after he finishes preaching at the end of chapter 30, that he writes it down. I see no reason to doubt that. There are probably little editorial comments, minor, I suspect. Uh, there's just a few verses here and there where, well, firstly, Moses is in the third person. So Moses said this, or Moses went on to say the opening paragraphs in the third person. Um, so I suspect Moses wrote the actual sermon down or, or his, his um, you know, his amanuensis or his secretary or whoever it was. And then somebody, maybe a touch later, added the opening paragraph and a couple of other things to sort of give it a bit more context. Um, and there's a couple of little verses that look as though they come from a bit later that, you know, maybe somebody has tweaked at a later point. They're, they're relatively inconsequential, I think. But um, the, the more uh, sceptical view of the origin of Deuteronomy, if I can call it sceptical, um, that is re related to Moses' uh, authorship, would be that the book was written around about 622 BC mm. by somebody or some people and planted it in the temple so that Josiah would find it in his reforms and then act upon it. And we know that the Book of the Covenant was found in the time of Josiah. I suspect it was part of, if not all, of Deuteronomy. Uh, certainly the responses that Josiah shows uh, at that time um, reflect emphases within Deuteronomy, including pulling down the idols in other places of worship and so on. Um, so it, it does seem that the book was found there. Was it written as a, what Wellhausen called a pious fraud? That is a good book, but it's a fraud because it's not by Moses, but somebody's written it for good purposes and planted it. It seems a bit, a bit far-fetched to me, to be honest. The motivations for reform from Josiah had already begun before the book was found probably stimulated by Jeremiah a few years earlier and maybe other things. The idea of the book being lost is not not um, problematic to me. Manasseh was the king for 50 odd years, a bad king, got rid of all you know, the scriptures and so on. People didn't have copies of the Bible in those days. So, you know, to lose uh, you know, the main copy in a, in a temple, you know, could be quite drastic in its consequences. And I think there's too many other things that, that make the book look as though it's it's much earlier. Um, there are people who think, you know, they, they, they've got convoluted arguments about Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, the Northern Kingdom, the Southern Kingdom. The simplest thing is that it, it predates the division of the kingdom, which divided mm -hmm. after Solomon's death, um, in my opinion. Yeah, super helpful. Um, so my next question is, what's the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy? Like, what's like kind of like maybe like um, the message or the key themes or like what's 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 the purpose of the book? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the purpose of the book, um, I think, is it's it it is historically the the final sermon of uh, Moses before his death. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's not going to enter the promised land. They're on the edge of the promised land, overlooking it on the plains of Moab, um, Mount Nebo area, the north end of the Dead Sea. So it, it's Moses, if you like, recapitulating it, the key things and mm -hmm. in a way passing on the baton to to Joshua. Um, so, but the book, I think, um, so so it, it, it brings together all the themes of the, Pen the main themes of the Pentateuch, in my opinion, the one, the one that's not quite so obvious, uh, just touched on here and there would be the creation theme, but certainly sin, Abrahamic promises, sojourn in Egypt, Exodus, wilderness, they're all there as significant themes in Deuteronomy. So Moses and law. So Moses is drawing all of those things together, but he's preaching it. So unlike, say, the law given at Sinai itself, which is, this is the law, uh, sort of information explanation, Moses is, exhort is exhortation to keep the law. So it takes it a step further, more or less, mm. I, I think. Um, but also I think uh, there's a poignancy about the book because whilst entering the land will be new, they've failed before. And so that, that I think is, is, the, is a sort of critical thing about this sermon. Moses knows that they've failed. Uh, at the spies incident a generation before all those adults have now died out in the wilderness now it's the children basically 
he's preaching to a group of people who are with only one or two exceptions under the age of 58 mm -hmm. and um and so he's um he's he's exhorting them to in a way do what their parents didn't do most of us think we're better than our parents um but we're not really we're we're morally the same uh, in general terms and um and so interestingly moses doesn't say you you guys you're better than your parents you can do what they didn't do he doesn't say that but actually there's a there's a um they're the same as their parents so where they failed they the parents failed they could he could expect the children will fail so he keeps drawing them to god to god's faithfulness and power and uh, that i think is the opening part of his sermon uh, so he's not just telling them what happened in the spies incident uh, some of them weren't born then others were up to the age of 20 then but he's preaching that incident so that they don't make the same mistake and um and and as they look forward to entering into a promised land that had been promised 600 years earlier to abraham so it's quite a significant event basically i think he he draws together as does the old testament in general and of course the new uh the themes of law and grace uh so the law is premised on a relationship established by grace in the old testament and uh you know i'm the lord your god who brought you out of the land of slavery that's an act of grace this now how is how you respond to me and and so law is in response to grace grace is freely given it's the same structure of relationship in the old testament as it is in the new testament um so that that's that's the situation maybe if i can just expand a little bit on mm -hmm on one thing I said, when um, Moses, the, the opening part of his sermon, yeah, the, this begins really at chapter one, verse six, after an introductory paragraph, uh, as he speaks to the people of Israel about the spies incident, and, and he does this over the rest of chapter one, all of two and pretty much all of three. Uh, so quite a long uh, section in a way. The, uh, why did the parents fail? And, um, the, the key answer to that is, is to do with the power and the faithfulness of God. So um, he, had, he, he recounts the fact that when the spies went into the land, the spies came back and said, these enemy in the land, they, they are tall and strong and their cities are fortified. And, um, but the people chickened out, let's say. So what happens next is Moses talks about different nations, uh, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and then uh, which Israel passes through, and, and then uh, Heshbon and, and um, Bashan, where they, um, they conquer them immediately before crossing the Jordan. The way that those stories are told is to show that strong, tall enemies and fortified cities are no threat to God. God is more powerful. So who do you trust? And if you trust God, then you will obey him by crossing the Jordan. Because if you don't trust God, you'd be mad to cross the Jordan. Um, but uh, so I think he's he's helping us see those sort of deep theological themes, actually, uh, that, that if you trust in God, then obedience will follow. Um, Paul calls it the obedience of faith in um, Romans 1, for example. And, uh, and in Deuteronomy 1, Moses, as he recounts their fa the failure of the parents, says they rebelled, and a few verses later he said they did not trust. And the two go together in both Testaments, this sort of faith and obedience tied together. So how do you, how do you counter that as a preacher? Because I'm, a, I'm, I'm largely a preacher. I'm, I'm more of a pastoral minister in a way than an academic. But um, so, so I suppose one reason why Deuteronomy speaks deeply to me is because uh it, it tells me about preaching in particular law law that mm. must be grounded in grace and and therefore if i'm to preach for my my congregation my church to be an obedient people then what i've actually got to do uh integrated into that is actually um preach to them the powerful faithfulness of god mm. uh, God is both powerful and faithful. And if, if God's faithful but not powerful, then, well, he, he uh, ultimately at some point his faithfulness will come unstuck because he can't deliver what he promises. A bit like politicians, actually. I think politicians often make 
sincere promises, but they don't keep them, often because they can't, because they don't have the full control over the international affairs or the domestic affairs or even their own party sometimes. Mm. And so they make a promise, but they don't keep it. Um, but God is, so, so the faithfulness of God depends upon the power of God. He's more powerful than tall, strong people and fortified cities. And he's faithful to the promises to Abraham to give land. And that's what Israel is to trust in. And if they trust in him, then they will cross the land and, and obey and, and conquer a, a, a strong enemy. Mm, mm, that's really good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Paul, in terms of like key themes to the book? Or do you think um, you've, you've summed it up well? Is there anything you want to add? Well, I think a, a famous verse in Deuteronomy, which points to a key theme, is uh, what's called the Shema, uh, which is a Hebrew word for hear, o, well, hear, uh, listen, that is. Uh, so Shema Israel, hear, O Israel. It's a term that occurs a number of times in Deuteronomy, not just once. But the famous one is chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> so hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. <laughs> And I think that um, uh, that that's a, a an important theme. I think in Deuteronomy, it reminds us that that even in the Old Testament, the laws, many of which look very superficial, you know, pick up your neighbor's animal, don't wear, you know, transvestitism, for example, looking after birds' nests, and um, uh, you know, a whole range of sort of different things. Don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Mm -hmm. They look a bit sort of, um, you know, they can look a bit tedious in a way. But, but but foundational to the whole law is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. So we need to read the laws with sympathy, in my opinion, and uh, see them as good laws, as Psalm 19 celebrates, and, um, and, and see them as expressions of loving God with all your heart. Related to that is all your heart. So in the ancient world, with just very rare exceptions, there was a heretic pharaoh uh, because he only believed, he was monotheistic, and they were, they thought he was a heretic, but Judaism, um, the Old Testament Israel, being monotheistic was astonishingly rare in the ancient world, and um, so we these days Islam as well as Judaism and Christianity are monotheistic religions, but in the ancient world, Judaism was sort of you know so different. Mm. So the Egyptians had many gods. Uh, the Canaanites had gods, Babylonians and Assyrians, and everyone had lots of gods. So the temptation was always, oh, you've got your god, Jehovah, Yahweh, uh, however you call it, uh, or him, and, um, well, we can add him in. We can have more gods. Mm. And for Israel, the great temptation always was to just add gods um, in. So to love the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, with all your heart and soul and strength, uh, that's quite a challenge in the ancient world. Uh, that's a monotheistic challenge. Uh, and it's and, and that's built on, uh, in particular, Deuteronomy 4, uh, which speaks about what other God has ever done, what this our God has done in, one, bringing people out from another nation like the Exodus, and two, speaking to them audibly on Mount Sinai in, in this case. No other God has done it. This was to show you that Yahweh alone is God. Therefore, love him with all your heart and soul and strength. So that, I think, is a, a, a pretty important theme. And it draws then into another theme that I think is critical in Deuteronomy that I touched on briefly earlier, is the place of the heart. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength. I don't think we're meant to think of three separate things entirely there. I think uh, rather that, that it's a rhetorical thing. Uh, groups of three are often powerful in, in, in rhetoric, Roman Greek rhetoric as well as modern. And, um, and so to love God with all your heart uh, is, is you, you know, your inner being, your key being, your, your soul. And so it's not just about putting on a veneer of respectable obedience. How do you love the Lord your God with all your heart? What's interesting in Deuteronomy 6 it, after this Shema is it then speaks about you shall teach the laws when you go out, when you come in, when you lie down, when you get up, etc., write them on your your wrists, your forehead, your gate posts, and above the door, and all that sort of thing. I think they're just, uh, if you like, images of whatever you do in any place and any time. The law is to form who you are as a person. We mm -hmm. can't, in a way, 
really literally put something into our heart. But, but the best measure we can do is to keep reflecting on the word of God uh, day and night, all the time, teaching about it to our children, teaching each other, encouraging each other. Uh, I don't think we do enough of that as Christians. And um, so getting our heart right. And that's why the climax of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, I think, is that God will circumcise your heart because in the end we can't do it. Um, so I think there are a couple more uh, crucial things, uh, I think, uh, in the book. Mm. Yeah, it's super helpful, and I appreciate you kind of walking through that. Um, so the next question, you hinted at this earlier, Paul, is like, what's the point of all the laws in Deuteronomy? Like some people, like you talk about like, getting stuck in like all these laws. So um, can you elaborate on like what's going on here, Paul? Yeah, the, a lot of the laws look very peculiar to us. Uh, I'm not sure that any of us have ever sort of paused before cooking dinner to think, am I boiling a young goat in its mother's milk here? <laughs> Um, so what, what's, what's going on with all the laws? I guess a few things. One is the law encompasses all of life and unusual in the ancient world. It integrates, if you like, social law with religious law. So the laws of Hammurabi, uh, in Babylon and, uh, Egyptian laws, the religion part of it is, is not, not included. They're more social laws, but the old Testament draws it together. That is, it's all integrated with loving God and fearing God and, and so on. Um, what God wants, basically, is his people to live under his law uh, in his promised land that would be an attraction for the world because God's always wanted the world to be blessed through the descendants of Abraham, so Genesis 12, verse 3. So the means by which that will happen is let's, you know, he'll bring the people as a mighty nation into the promised land where they will live in purity within that land. And uh, under obedience to God, they'll be blessed as covenant blessings, Deuteronomy 27 and 28, pick up those, those, those covenant blessings. And that then should be a, an attraction for the world to come to God. It doesn't happen in the Old Testament very much at all because, not because God's faithless, but because Israel is. So then we see, well, what, what are some of these laws? Uh, some of them make sense, you know, don't move a, a neighbor's property marker because, you know, you've got fixed property and don't be greedy and don't steal and so on. The Ten Commandments come in Deuteronomy 5 as a sort of preliminary document for all the laws. Some say that Deuteronomy 6 to 26, which is the bulk of the laws, is like an exposition of the Ten Commandments, so fleshing them out in much more detail uh, one by one. Uh, it's hard to say that's exactly the case for every law, but there does seem to be a bit of a pattern. There's laws about leaders in Jeremiah 16 to 18, judges, priests, prophets, and kings, all of whom will come under the rule of God, which again is different from the ancient world. None of them is to be corrupt uh, mm. and self-seeking, for example. There are laws of ceremonies and sacrifices in, um, well, in different chapters, chapter 16, for example, and a little bit earlier in Deuteronomy as well, not to engage in, in pagan sacrifice, practices or places, um, feasts three times a year in particular for the Feast of Passover, uh, weeks or Pentecost as it's called in Greek, and then later the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. Uh, so uh, those feasts, there's not lots of sacrificial law in Deuteronomy. I think it assumes what's in Leviticus. Uh, there's rules of clean and unclean food. Uh, that's that's peculiar to us, I, I, I would guess. Um, having taught in Asia a lot, I know that uh, people there couldn't cope with the clean and unclean food laws because mostly the Chinese in Malaysia particularly like pork and prawns and uh, or shrimps, and uh, you know they're unclean in the Old Testament. Behind all the laws, though, are principles. Um, there's always some reason for a law, even if it's not expressed. Do not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. It's its mother's milk, not in any milk. So it's not about mixing meat and milk products together, which is how modern Judaism has understood this law. So you can't eat meat and milk in the same meal, uh, dairy and milk, for example, in separate kitchens in kosher uh, hotels and so on. But rather, I think uh, mother's milk is meant to bring life. To boil a young goat in its mother's milk is to bring death. And so it seems perverse, and most likely it's a pagan ritual. And they're being told, do not, do not adopt this sort of pagan ritual. A bit like some of the, you know, cutting yourself, the 
for funerals and and some of the other things where where clearly it's you know you shall not do like the Canaanites do or or whatever. Mm. Uh, so it's it's living putting into practice various principles from God. Um, what what we lose sometimes in law uh, is is the sort of we look at the surface of the law but we don't get what the principle behind it is and um and so we do a practice that seems peculiar without thinking about where it fits um in the ancient in is in deuteronomy uh, 22 uh there's a law about a parapet on the roof of your house a fence in a way like a veranda and um well, in, in Israel and Middle East uh, to this day, and in hot cu countries and dry countries like that, flat roofs are common. And you would be on the roof in the cool of the evening. You might sleep there some parts of the year, uh, dry your clothes there, play games there. You need a veranda to be safe. Uh, when I used to live in Malaysia, no roofs were flat. They were all uh, pitched to us because it's so tropical and so much rain. Mm. So nobody went on the roof. You don't need a parapet mm. because it's not an issue of safety. But the principle is safety. And so today we'd say, well, uh, you know, if, if this same principle applies, as, as I think it would, uh, is my house safe for visitors? Is my house safe for the elderly or the children? Are they going to run out onto the street or, or whatever it might be? So, so looking behind the, the principles of the law, I think, matters. And ultimately, even though you know, Jesus said this, he's not saying something new when he says the two great commandments are, love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbors expressed in Leviticus, not in Deuteronomy. But the laws about picking up your neighbor's property and animals and things like that, that that's about loving your neighbor. And so there is this sort of hierarchy of principle in a way. Uh, I think the law both points us to the ideal, love your neighbor, love God, etc. don't steal. Uh, but it also points us to the realism of a fallen world. You know, if somebody's wife leaves or husband leaves and you divorce then this is what you do it doesn't mean divorce is good it's about how to live in a fallen world which is actually what jesus explained to the pharisees as well in matthew for example mm, that's super helpful um the next question i have for you is probably one of the most common things that like i'll hear from skeptics and the, it's the question of like did god command genocide in like the book of deuteronomy like there's lots of um questions where we'll look at like certain texts and it seems to suggest that like god is commanding um the eradication of like the entire group of people whether it's like the canaanites or someone else um so in your opinion paul how do we deal with these texts of supposedly god commanding genocide yeah it's become a big issue i think since 9 11 actually um the number of books and articles written on uh, genocide warfare in the Old Testament has um, has exploded in the last 20 years, uh, really. There, when I studied in the 80s, there was a, a little book on this topic um, and um, not much else, uh, really. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, grown as an issue now, and um, especially through 9-11. I think there are a few things that we, we ought to keep in mind. Um, it's true that God does command the killing of Canaanites in general and other nations living in the promised land. Uh, it's limited to the boundaries of the promised land. Israel is not to go killing everybody and anybody. Um, Genesis 15 verse 16 speaks about um, the time for the Amorites is not yet complete. That is, their sins are not yet complete. So uh, reading in that context and in the light of what is said about them at times in Deuteronomy and, and elsewhere, uh, these are people who, at times at least, uh, committed, say, child sacrifice. Not all the time, of course, otherwise they'd die out pretty quickly. Um, they were immoral in various ways and idolatrous. Uh, we don't think of idolatry as an issue, uh, of moral issue in our society, I think, uh, these days. But it was, uh, and it is to God. So there are sins that are being punished, uh, basically. I think it's fair to say um, we need to see this also as, um, uh, as, a, as an anticipation of the final judgment day. So on the final judgment day, won't God judge those who are opposed to him, who don't believe in him, who uh, live um, unrepentant, immoral or idolatrous lives? And so what happened to the, let's say, the inhabitants of Jericho then, uh, that's in Joshua, but anticipated in Deuteronomy, um, what happened to them 
then is qualitatively no different from what will happen on the final day of Christ's judgment uh, when the separation of sheep and goats, for example, or the other imagery that Jesus uses in different parables will occur. Mm. So um, is it ethnic? So one of the objections is that it's a genocide, that is, it's an ethnic uh, killing. Uh, it's, it's true that the Old Testament deals maybe a bit more in the concept of nations as groups than we might think. We're very individualistic in our societies in the West. Mm. So, so the Bible challenges us on that time and again, actually, in lots of ways. Mm. Um, but also the Bible makes it clear, the Old Testament makes it clear that it's not simply ethnic. I mean, these are the sins of the people and, um, and, and they will be judged for it. But, but there are exceptions. You know, Rahab the harlot in Joshua 2 is saved because of her faith and trust in the Lord God. So she's a Canaanite. Now, if, if it's an ethnic cleansing or a genocide, then it doesn't matter what she does, she should be killed. So rather, I think it's an ethical cleansing, not an ethnic cleansing. So in all the laws for Israel in Deuteronomy, if you especially, and, the, and it's not for any breaking of any law, but for for major laws, especially the first sort of six or seven of the Ten Commandments, um, idolatry, um, dishonouring your parents, murder, um, not so much uh, theft, uh, but but those sorts of things, then if, you're, if you, an Israelite, uh, is guilty of that, then you will be put to death. You'll be pur purged the evil from the midst, is the phrase that's used a few times in Deuteronomy. That is, you'll be treated like a Canaanite because you're acting like a Canaanite. So on the one, one hand, some Canaanites would be spared like Rahab. And on the other hand, some Israelites, by their ethical behavior, identify with Canaanites and they will be put to death as well. So, so I think that those are important sort of qualifications. As I said, uh, it is limited in the promised land. So in Deuteronomy 20, verse 10 onwards, um, there's a distinction between how Israel deals with nations far off and nations that are near. Far off means outside the land, peace treaties are offered to them. Inside the land, they're to be put to death because their sins are complete, God's judging them. Israel is the agent of God's judgment and, uh, and God wants them to set up, a, if you like, a pure community within the land. One of the differences for us, of course, uh, is, well, how, what does this mean for us? Should I go down the road and you know kill the people who are worshiping other gods? And not at all, because, for various reasons of the trajectory of themes from the old into the New Testament. We don't belong in the earthly land of Israel. Uh, we belong in a heavenly kingdom. We don't have to evict anyone for us to be in there. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the agent of judgment, not ancient Israel. Jesus succeeds at that. Our involvement as agents of judgment, I think, is by preaching the gospel. So as we preach the gospel of Christ, uh, we pray and hope that, that people will respond in faith and obedience. But to the degree that they don't and maybe have hearts, hearts hardened against God, then uh, they will, um, uh, we, we are in a, in, in a way confirming their future judgment, but we're not the actual mm -hmm. agent of, of that judgment. So I think we need to read this in the light of, um, uh, you know, the, the New Testament and the major themes of land and nation and where they lead to in Christ in the New Testament as well. So they, they, there are a few a, a few comments, I suppose, um, uh, about that about that issue. It is a troublesome issue. We shouldn't delight in anybody being put to death, um, but we recognise that that at the end God will judge, and mm. and uh, and and so it should motivate us. Uh, I think, to seek to win people for Christ so that they escape the judgment of the final day. Mm. Yes, I appreciate your response, Paul. It's definitely a difficult question to chew on and think about. Um, my last question for you here before we wrap up, and we might do a little bit of audience Q&A &A on our way out, is how does Deuteronomy fit into the larger picture of Scripture and the rest of the Bible and the, the Old and the New Testament? And how, how does it all fit together? Well, I sometimes joke with my uh, New Testament lecturer friends that uh, Paul just plagiarizes Deuteronomy. <laughs> um, 
It is uh, quoted quite often, uh, fourth most quoted book in the New Testament. Um, Jesus quotes it uh, several times. Um, Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, for example. He quotes Deuteronomy all three times in his own wilderness 40 days with the serpent and um, showing himself to be a child of Israel who succeeds, if you like, or obeys in, in faith, unlike ancient Israel, uh, as the sons of God, as Exodus 4 calls them. Um, theologically, I think it shows the same theological structure of if you like, a covenant grace that is to stimulate faithful obedience. Mm. Um, uh, so, so that I think is a, is a pretty critical thing. And as I said earlier on, uh, I think a crucial verse, the climax of uh, Moses' sermon really is, uh, God will circumcise your hearts so that you will love and obey him, therefore choose God. And where do we find that fulfilled? In Moses' construction, he speaks in Deuteronomy 30 of uh, you will go into exile because of your sins. Just the lead up to that's in Deuteronomy 29. But from there, God will gather you and bring you back and circumcise your heart. Well, as you keep reading in the Old Testament, they go into exile. They're scattered among the nations. And just like Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 that I referred to before, they all speak of a return from exile with a, with a changed heart. But when they come back from exile, when the Persians conquer the Babylonians and Cyrus allows them to return in 538, the, the hearts are not changed. You see that in Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, the people are no, no qualitatively different from before the exile. Does that mean it didn't happen? When's it going to happen? And then when you get to Christ and Jesus' powerful death, uh, we realize that as we understand that death, that's where our hearts are circumcised. Uh, so Paul speaks about that, the circumcision that counts is not of flesh but of spirit at, at the end of Romans 2. And in Colossians 2, we're identified in Christ in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And um, and and our hearts are, are circumcised um, in him. Hmm. That doesn't mean now we're perfect, far from it. But it does mean that there is something that's happened by God's spirit uh, within us and uh, and is changing us more into the likeness of Christ. Um, mm. So I think Deuteronomy, uh, you know, fit, fits in neatly into you know, biblical theology as a whole. And um, uh, basically, without being, if you like, a sort of standard messianic uh, prediction, uh, it does nonetheless look forward to. Um, to a, to an act of God to change our hearts. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Paul. Um, we do have one live question here that we'll look at um, on our way out. Swift C says, um, if the Old Testament had kept the covenant in the Torah, um, what do you think of what would have happened in, instead of the exile? Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts here, Paul. I know it's a little bit out of the scope of just Deuteronomy, but I'm curious if you have anything, any ideas? Sure. Well, it's a hypothetical. And of course, they didn't uh, keep the covenant in the Torah. Um, and I, knew, I think God knew that that would not happen. So, you know, the New Testament makes it clear, for example, in Ephesians 1, that before the foundation of the world, uh, God chose us in Christ. So right from before Genesis 1, verse 1, God knew that Jesus would come to be the Savior, and, and that's the best thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a bit, bit hard to answer a hypothetical question because they, they mm -hmm. weren't going to the covenant. Uh, their hearts were not right. Um, but I, I suppose... Um, they wouldn't have been in exile. They would have had perfect kings. Uh, you know, keeping the covenant means perfection, basically, and um, and the nation would have attracted other people to come to to God because God would have blessed them, as described, say, in Leviticus twenty six or Deuteronomy twenty eight, with uh, you know rain and abundance and fertility and security and no sickness and all those sorts of things. Mm. Um, it would have been a very different history, um, I, I imagine. I guess so. I appreciate you answering that hypothetical question, Paul. Um, and we're around at the end of our time. So do you have any kind of like last thoughts, things you get to say before we wrap things up here? Oh, let me encourage people to read Deuteronomy. And, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I would even re read it aloud. It's, it was spoken. You know, a lot of the Bible comes to us as original writing. What I mean is that Paul sat down with a pen or you know, something, quill or something, and started writing. And so I assume did the writers of Kings and Samuel. But there are some books in the Bible that started with speaking, uh, prophetic books, um, 
probably significant parts of the Gospels uh, and Deuteronomy. And, uh, and so to hear it spoken, read aloud uh, or read it aloud uh, is a good thing. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I think that um, that will capture some of the, the sort of original feel of the book. Um, I've been listening this year for the first time to the Bible read aloud by David Suchet, an English actor. And uh, he's a breathtakingly good reader. And it makes even what I normally think of boring bits of the Bible, like lists of people and groups in, uh, say, um, Chronicles, uh, come alive and is interesting. So things like that to, to sort of vary the way we read scripture, um, I think would be well worth doing. Hmm, that's super interesting, and I appreciate that. Well, Paul, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Um, lots of great content. You can check out Paul, Park, Paul Barker and everything he's got going on um, down below. Um, and I think thank you, everyone, who tuned in today live, um, Nate and Susan and Santi and everyone else. Um, so if you're new to the channel, always encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. And if you enjoy the channel, you can become a patron at patreon.com. So should hear an apologetics if you enjoy the show. Please consider supporting. But, Paul, thank you so much for your time. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you're so welcome. grateful. And you're thank welcome. you, everyone, who tuned in. Farewell. Farewell. Thank you, everyone, who tuned in. Have a good one, and God bless.